links that are in the chat right now. The first is a link to download the slides uh, in PDF. Some people really like having that with them. Um, the second is to download a worksheet. And you may have gotten this worksheet already, but this session is really about you. And it's gonna be about you being able to reflect on and build the resources as we go along to be resilient, to unlock your resilience. And so as we go forth, there's gonna be a number of times where I ask you, write this down. And I know it's so tempting on Zoom to not write it down. <laughs> it's just like, wait, you know, just like, yeah, I'll write that down later. But I really want to politely challenge you when I say, you know, write down the answer to this question that you write it down today, because that's how you're gonna get the most out of this. Because when you leave today, if you fill out that worksheet uh, or just have a sheet of paper with the answers to those questions, you will have unlocked the resources you already have to be resilient. Uh, and so really recommend that you do that and wanna challenge you, uh, politely challenge you to do that. So let's jump in. I'm, Carla went through my introduction. You'll hear a little bit more about me, maybe even see my kids throughout the presentation. Uh, but what I'd like for you to do is if you could in the chat, maybe just type your name, what town, city you're, you're uh, coming from, and just one word that describes how you're doing today. Uh, that would be great, just so everybody understands sort of the energy in the room. And, and be honest, I'm a little bit uh, flustered because my computer just completely almost exploded this morning. And so I had to like get a new uh, USB port external thing and all of that, all of the joys of the virtual life. So Carla feeling hopeful and grateful for the weekend ahead. Shalisa, Lake County, remember TGIF, great. I guess that's a word, curious, balanced, good. Keep those coming and we're gonna uh, jump in here today. And it's good to do that just to get the energy of your teams anytime you're on a Zoom call. I always like to start this way. So here's the thing about resilience that I wanna make sure everybody knows. You already are resilient. Resilience is not something you get from a Zach Mercurio webinar. <laughs> it's not something you go find uh, in a blog post. It's something you liberate. You already have the resources to be resilient. Today is about acknowledging and using and activating those resources. Someone once told me at the beginning of this pandemic, I was working with a client who was really struggling. And he said to me, well, Zach, I have a hundred percent survival rate. I'm here. Everybody on this call, you have a 100% survival rate. You are already resilient. And so I think that that is something that's really important when we talk about resilience um, to, to think about, that it's not about finding it, it's not about going out and getting it, it's about liberating it and using it and activating it. And so just to get us started with thinking about this, I want you to think about a significant challenge in your life that you didn't choose, but you made it through, which... 100% of you did make it through because you're here today. So a significant challenge in your life that you did not choose, but you made it through. And I want you to think about what actions did you take to persevere and what strengths or personality traits did you use to navigate that change or that challenge? So think about a challenge that in your life that you didn't choose, but you made it through. Maybe write down some notes. And what actions did you take to persevere? What strengths or personality traits did you use? Take a couple minutes just to think about what actions you took or strengths or personality traits you used to make it through. And what I'd like for you to do, and we're going to be using the chat a lot today, is to type in two to three words in the chat that best describe how you persevered. So go ahead and think about this question and then type in uh, a couple of words, one to two words that describe how you persevered. Good, maintain professionalism, thank you. Perspective, empathy, bravery, good. Uh, maintain professionalism, just did it. Yeah, just kept moving forward, I love that. Spiritual connection, community, support, Spend time outdoors. So you did something that elicited a positive emotion for you. You were resourceful. You never gave up, determined, 
compassion. Good. And now as you think about these things that you just wrote down about uh, what you used to move through this challenge, think about which one of those aren't you using to address a challenge now? Which one of those strengths aren't you leaning into now uh, with a challenge you're facing that may be causing you to struggle? And you don't have to write that in the chat because I'm not gonna let you broadcast this to the world. This is, this is yours. But really want you to look at those things and ask yourself, what could I use more of now that I've already used? Because this is your system. Your system of resilience is right here in this chat, all of these resources. But sometimes when we're going through a challenge, when we're reacting to something negative, we're just doing that. We're reacting instead of productively responding using our resources. So uh, resilience is a couple of things. It's liberating the positive resources you already have to carry on. So making sure that you're regularly reflecting on how you've made it through and you, you lean on those and, and critically reflect on what parts of that aren't you using now for a particular challenge. So it's a deliberate system. It's also developed, which means, as you all probably know, we don't thrive despite challenges. We thrive precisely because of them. We thrive because of the resources that we've created as we've moved through challenges. So today is going to be about identifying some of those that you already have to continue to move through. And then the title of this webinar was Resilience is on Purpose. So resilience is deliberate. It doesn't just happen, right? Because we think of ourselves as resilient. It's a deliberate system that's activated. So when I say resilience is on purpose, I mean that resilience is deliberate. And let me give you an example of something that we can learn from nature about resilience. In the really catastrophic flooding of 2017 in Houston, uh, neighbors and people in a neighborhood noticed something very disturbing as if a flood wasn't enough. They noticed these floating piles of fire ants floating in the flood. Yeah, I see Carla like lifting her eyes up right now. And it looks fairly gross and disgusting and frightening. But what is really remarkable is scientists have really not seen this behavior before. And they started studying what was going on. So there's this external situation going on with these fire ants. There's the flood. But they had built a system to where they could interlock hands. Essentially, the ants held hands to become one and to float. And if you wanna see a picture of ants holding hands, there it is. So you did that today on this Friday, but they've developed the system of being able to respond to the challenge by creating a network of fire ants so they could float, right? It, it was deliberate. Resilience in nature is deliberate, right? They didn't just become fire ants and know that they would have to float sometime. No, they experienced the challenge of being in floods and have developed this system to enable themselves to carry on. But also when we think about our lives, that's exactly how we can be as well when it comes to a deliberate system. And there are a few elements we know that create a system for resilience. And this is from the research on what makes people resilient and what creates a resilient system. On the last page of the worksheet, there is a area where you can fill out some questions that prompt you on each of these. Yes, Carla has it. That's awesome. And it'll help you just take stock of what your system is, what your ant handholding system is. And the first element that we know creates resilience and activates it is meaning and purpose, to know why we are, to understand the bigger vision and purpose that we're striving for. It's the question of who needs us to carry on. The second is a positive outlook. It's responding instead of reacting. Positivity is not that everything is great. It's that I have the power to choose a response to anything. So it's a very key point is that I never say be positive. I only say respond and act positively. The third is self-belief. So we have to believe that we can make it through, right? Uh, someone wrote in the chat, like, just do it. 
when you just do something and you make it through, you give yourself the evidence that you can. So reminding yourself that I've been there and I can do it is powerful. The third is problem solving. That's where reflecting back on those instances of challenge in your life and potentially with your teams is really fruitful because it shows you that we have the skills already to solve problems. And then finally, social support. So reaching out to one another, being on webinars like this, talking with one another, having those relationships that support you is important. And as many of you all mentioned, self-care, because none of this is possible unless you take care of yourself. But also none of this is possible without the other concepts. So one thing that you might do after this webinar is to take a look at that plan, the system of resilience, and ask some of those questions of yourselves. And which ones are you not activating that you could activate? And if you want to in the chat right now, as you look at this, maybe type in uh, which area of this system of resilience might you need to more deliberately activate. And so uh, put that in there in, in the chat and you might get a sense of where everybody's at when it comes to uh, building a system of resilience. I know for me, a lot of times I have to remind myself of that self-belief, right? Of knowing that I can do it. Um, for some of you, it might be social support or self-care. And it's a great way to know what you need to do to be ready for when things don't go well in the future. So I hope that's very useful to you all. And one of the other things, not only is resilience on purpose, so it's the result of having this system in place, it's also driven and activated by purpose. There's actually no reason to do any of the other things if there's no reason to carry on. It's almost like to survive, we need a will to survive. So not only is resilient on purpose, it's activated by purpose. Because do you know the only reason why those fire ants activate that system, and I'm going to show you another picture of an ant, I'm sorry if this is grossing you out, is because of this queen ant. That's their purpose, is to protect the queen. That's the reason why they created this system. When we look at resilience in nature, one of the things that is common amongst resilient animals is that they have this bigger purpose to commune or community outside the self. It's that will to survive. So that's why today we're going to talk about these two things, right? How do we deliberately be resilient and cultivate this system? But how do we do it in the frame of reference that we consistently reflect on and enact our purpose? And Viktor Frankl, uh, in his book called Man's Search for Meaning, says that those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. And he had a, quite a bit of authority to talk about this. He was a psychiatrist who was also a prisoner in a concentration camp. And when he was in that uh, concentration camp, some of the most horrific human conditions possible, he applied his psychiatric training and was observing other prisoners who were surviving. And not only surviving, he said, but thriving in extreme suffering. And he said that the commonality between all of them is they constantly thought about and talked about their bigger why outside of the situation that bigger meaning. And oftentimes purpose can be so theoretical and like, you know, your bigger purpose, you all on this call have a clear purpose, but oftentimes we don't know how to consistently activate it in how we respond to circumstances and why this is so important when we think of vicarious trauma and thinking about the nefarious effects of trauma is that vicarious trauma, if you haven't heard that term, is when someone who's exposed to trauma over-identifies with the trauma they're experiencing and over-empathizes with to the point where it could consume your identity. And everybody who handles difficult situations or trauma is susceptible to vicarious trauma. But some of the most um, dire outcomes of that is we start questioning our identity. Like, who am I? Why has this happened to this person? Am I responsible? Has this happened to me in the past? We can start questioning our own role in it, our own role in society, creating a society where it's possible for some of these things to happen.
The second thing that research finds happens when we uh, experience trauma often is that we start questioning our worldview. I don't know if any of you have had this question of, is the world just, is it good? I mean, how, how could this happen? Uh, are my principles valid? Am I good? What's the point? You know, and we can really get into this um, place of what researchers call spiritual impoverishment, which has been called the most malignant consequence of secondary trauma is where we lose that positive outlook and that affirmative outlook on the world. We lose that sense of our own purpose in reacting to the difficulty. And so one of the key components to resist and to protect against that despair is meaning and maintaining meaningfulness. Viktor Frankl also said that despair is suffering minus meaning. So despair is when we suffer without being tightly connected to why we're going through that. And so today we're going to talk about how do you reconnect with purpose to tightly bind it up with how you respond to difficulty, but then also how you build your system of self-care, of social support, of problem solving. It's that, so that what? I'm being resilient, so that what? And that's how we're going to lead today. And when we think about things like burnout and compassion fatigue, I'm not saying that being resilient using purpose is going out and helping more. Because if I said that, you all, I would be back in a month doing a compassion fatigue training. But what purpose is, is the mindset through which we approach our challenges and approach. So it's the lens that I'm going through this so that what, and being able to attach that bigger reason to what we're going through right now. And when we look at like key factors that reduce burnout, aside from manageable workload and just trauma avoidance, which if you chose this profession, probably aren't realistic options, right? I often say that those things are generally don't change. I mean, we chose a hard profession, right? We chose a hard role and like doing important things is hard. But aside from those things, the number, uh, the top three areas that help protect against burnout are clear values, knowing our values, having a sense of community right here, right now, and the intrinsic reward of the work, making sure that we're maintaining purpose. When we look at social workers, for example, um, and the research who, uh, social workers who are high, high performing and highly resilient, uh, they have three things in common. There's a general positive approach, positive response, a positive reassessment of negative work events. So they're able to reframe and then they seek outward social support. And if you notice, it's a looking outward, it's expanding our attention are the similarities that comprise a highly resilient uh, person who's exposed to some of the things that we're all exposed to. So here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk about why purpose is important for resilience and, and what purpose actually is. We're going to go through some tools to craft a purposeful mindset when we're approaching trauma or difficulty in work or just in our lives. And then we're actually going to end today with having you be able to state your purpose. I'm going to walk you through an exercise where everybody should leave with a clear statement of, of purpose that you have to reflect back on and how we can use that uh, together. So what I want you to do right now is just take a couple minutes and answer this question. If you think about the last seven days of your life, I'd like you to think about which moment in your life has given you the greatest sense of purpose, whatever that means to you. So take a minute or so and just think about this on your own and think about which moment in your life has given you the greatest sense of purpose, whatever that means to you, and, and write that moment down. And then when you're done thinking of that, if you could just type in the chat some words that describe what you were doing in that moment. So go ahead and take some time to think about that moment and then type into the chat some words that describe what you were doing in that moment. Mati, thanks, started us off saying supporting others. Genuine quality time, good. 
keeping promises, caring, listening, family. Expressing gratitude, being present, being a grandma, having family time, yeah. Taking care of her mom, writing thank you notes, watching children make progress, awesome. Connecting to colleagues. This is a really powerful question to ask of yourself. And you know, one thing I might have you think about right now is when the, when's the last time you asked yourself this question? Uh, and oftentimes some people say, well, I've never asked this question until this webinar. But at the end of each week, one really powerful way to start reconnecting to purpose, especially in difficult weeks, is to ask yourself this question. Every Friday afternoon, just put it in your calendar. Um, which moment this week has given me the greatest sense of purpose? And continually look back on that. Because the questions we ask determine the answers that we get. And they determine how we think about things. So this is one way of maintaining a connection to that purpose and what brings you purpose. And if you'll notice, you know, we ask this of thousands of people across the world. If you notice nobody in this uh, Zoom call said, oh, when I got my direct deposit or like when I got through to Friday or when I made it through the week, right? Or when I just got through that difficult shift or like we tend to not think of purpose as what we acquire or achieve. Like I achieved the weekend, right? Even though we're TGIFing right now, many uh, of us are not thinking about when we think about what gives us purpose are making it to the end of something. Now think about how we approach our days, right? I know me and I do this work. I work with a lot of frontline workers on meaning and purpose and mental health. I was realizing last month that I had a very bad habit. I would pick up my phone and I would say, oh, what do I have to do today? Right? That's not, that's a very results oriented mindset. What am I going to do? But a purposeful mindset is how is what I'm going to do today going to impact others? Right? So just these little frames of mind and these questions like this can be really powerful. And I'm going to give you some more examples of those as well. But uh, maybe ask your partner this or your spouse or your kids. It's, it's a very powerful question. And you'll be surprised at what happens on a team, especially people who are in response and reaction mode, which I know a lot of you and your occupations are, what this can open up on a team. I've had people ask this questions that learn things about people they worked with that they've worked with for 10 years that they didn't know. So you all sort of described it, but purpose is really simple. It's defined as the reason for which something is created or for which something exists. If you notice that most of you wrote down something in the chat that had to do with your contribution to others, it's the thing that outlasts you. It's your legacy. It's the human problem you exist to solve. Now, when you just continue to help people, yes, you'll get burnout and compassion fatigue. But when you forget this purpose or don't think about it in the midst of challenge, we can also get burnout and compassion fatigue. One of the top reasons why doctors and nurses experience burnout, when you look at the factors beyond manageable workload and being under-resourced is depersonalization. So it's actually that mentally they've become depersonalized from their bigger purpose because of all the other things going on. And so closing that gap is, is really important, but there's a big difference, right? Between having purpose and being purposeful. So you may say to me, Zach, um, I already have purpose. I save children's lives. <laughs> like, that's why I'm here. Like, it's so clear, right? I have purpose. But there's a difference between having that and knowing it and approaching our challenges with that lens every single day. I work with trauma surgeons who forget the, about the human being who's on the table right? But I work with janitors and mechanics who find profound purpose in their work. So you can have a meaningful job without experiencing meaningfulness in your job. And so it's important to remember that meaningfulness is maintained and being purposeful is contribution-centered thinking, being, and doing. You all already have the doing part down, but it's the lens through which we interpret and respond to our challenges. And one of the big challenges in human service work is that often the good work can become routine work. Like for you, it's just like you get up and save children's lives, right? Hey, here we go, we're going on a webinar. What are you doing today? Like, it's just routine for you. Like when my wife asks, what are you doing today? Who are you speaking to? And I describe what you all do. 
uh, she's like, oh my gosh, but for you, it's just another day, right? And what we find in nonprofit work and human service work is that oftentimes the good work can become routine work without the conscious effort to stop, to reframe, to pause and to think about that bigger why. And I like to show it like this, is that most of us are very, you know, when we get into our, our fields, especially in social work, very tightly coupled between what we do and why we do it, right? It's very, we know why we're here. It's clear, it's connected to what we do. But then inevitably things happen, right? External pressures happen. We experience these negative experiences over time, or we have to react to things. And what happens is as we spend more of our attention reacting to the what over time, and we see this in tenure, in uh, teaching professions and in education, is that the connection to the why over time can be reduced because we've spent so much of our attention reacting to the what. What do I have to do? What do I have to get through? How am I going to get through it? And what happens is the more attention we focus on the what and reacting, the less attention we have to focus and nurture our why, and there's a split. Now, the problem and the ironic problem is, is that when we reduce our attention on our why, on our purpose, either individually or collectively as agencies, and we focus more on the what, we actually inadvertently deplete the very energy and resources we need to respond to the what. And we get into a cycle. And so purposeful people tend to keep these tightly coupled. They keep their why and their purpose tightly coupled with the what and their responses. When we just react on instinct and we spend more attention re reacting and responding to the what, what happens is, is that we start experiencing these instinctual emotions like anger, fear, worry, despair. And all of these things are normal and natural to name and to feel. The problem is, is that when we act on them, because these emotions only evolve to help us survive. So when something happens to us or we see something and we experience fear or anger, what happens is, is your brain gets flooded with endorphins, your cardiovascular system gets going, and your body reacts as if it's being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, right? That you're literally, you are in a survival scenario. And what happens is naturally, it's great if we want to survive, but our body narrows our attention to focus on our own survival. And so we actually become worse at creating relationships. We actually become worse at problem solving. We become worse at self-care because when someone's just trying to survive, we actually don't care as much about our self-care. We become worse at seeking social support and looking outward. And if you notice all the things I just said, they're all part of that system of resilience. So when we react on instinct, instead of responding on purpose, we tend to narrow our attention. Today, when we get into some of the practices, I'm gonna talk about ways in which we can respond on purpose so that we feel things like joy, inspiration, belief, which expand our attention and enable us to thrive. And the key lesson here is that meaningfulness must be maintained in practice. Purpose must be maintained and practiced, even in a role in which you have, especially, I would say, in a role in which your purpose is so clear. I imagine it to being like, you're like fish in water, right? Your purpose is all around you. Purposeful people regularly say, this is water. This is water all around us. They name the purpose. They make it explicit versus implicit in your roles. So let's talk about why purpose, and then we're going to get into some practices that we can move through together. Um, well, one of the reasons why reflecting on purpose, especially in challenge, is so important is because it activates something very primitive in our brain called the seeking system. As I told you, uh, I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old and a home office, and so my life is really interesting. And when I was writing my first book on the science of purpose, my then, uh, he was around three, came scurrying into my office. And there he is right there with the nice product placement for the book. Uh, and he came scurrying in my office and he was looking at me. And he said, daddy, daddy, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm working. And he looked at me and he said, why? And I stopped and I was like, well, you know, I think these people are really going to benefit from me writing this. And he looked at me again and he said, Why? And I paused and had a mini existential crisis. And I was like, 
why am I working right now? Like, why am I doing this? Why am I spending my incredibly rare existence doing what I'm doing? And he made me think of a couple of things that we know in the research. One, as soon as we learn language to make sense of the world, our brains are wired to ask that question. In every language equivalent around the world, when toddlers, and you all know if you're around kids a lot, when toddlers learn to use language to make sense of the world, the first word we use is why. We're wired to ask why. It's our seeking system. And that never goes away, including in challenges. But oftentimes we try to suppress that and, and don't answer it explicitly in our everyday. The other uh, thing that he reminded me of is that question is really annoying. When people ask why of us, it's annoying because we have to justify our existence. We have to provide, you know, this is our usefulness. This is why I'm spending my time doing what I'm doing. But when we do, it serves as one of the most profound motivational forces. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little exercise. So I want you to, when you look at the screen, there's going to be an animation that comes up. There's no sound with it. So nothing's broken. I just want you to watch it. And I want you to ask yourself what is happening here. So there's going to be an animation that comes on the screen, watch it, check it out, and then ask yourself, what do I see happening here? Oh, sorry, it froze. I'm gonna, I'll, give you a, I'll give you another chance. I'm going to start that again. So take a look at it and then ask yourself, what is happening here? There you go. Okay, some of you are like, what is literally happening on this Zoom call right now? But what I want you to think about is what, what do you see happening here? Uh, and, and I want you to write it in the chat, what you saw going on. But then if anybody would be willing to come off mute and raise your hand and let me know what you saw happening, that would be great if you'd like to participate. So what did you see happening in that, um, in that animation? So someone said domestic violence. Uh, competition, bullying. <laughs> Somebody not wanting to be accepted. Yeah, uh, like not wanting to be accepted. And, yeah. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, not wanting to be accepted. Creature in a cage, bullying that destroyed the house. Real-time footage of my hapless organizational process in 2020. Thank you, Monty. Figures were fighting. Then I began to think they were playing. Good. Anybody else have any ideas? Feel free to use the raise hand function. Giving up. Monty wins, Carlos says. Protection. Let's see what else. Protection, control of the circle. Okay. So anybody else want to put your answers in? Just uh, give you a chance before I tell you exactly what was happening there. Isolation. Okay, so here's what actually happened here. And the answer is absolutely nothing. Social scientists are the worst. I just did a psychological experiment on you without your consent. These are two dimensions. <laughs> Soledad just gave me a thumbs up. These are two dimensional black shapes moving randomly on a white screen. Nothing happened. It's a classic 1944 experiment by these two psychologists named Hyder and Simmel. They had uh, some graduate assistants come up with a flipbook animation of shapes moving around. They asked about 130 people what they saw happening, and almost every single one of them came up with some sort of emotionally compelling story, 
we attach uh, situations, emotions, anger, right? Some people will all of a sudden give the triangle a gender, right? If they'll say he, if that's not a man triangle, I don't know what is, right? All of a sudden the triangles are chasing each other around. There's a family situation, but there's nothing happening here. And it's a classic attribution study that shows that our brains are wired to search for meaning and purpose in the chaos. We're wired to create a storyline. And what happens, especially in challenges and things that are happening to us in work, when that storyline and context is not clear, we tend to just react and make up it as we go. So imagine this, right? If I were to say to you, hey, these are kids playing in a park. And then I were to say, hey, what is happening here? How might your interpretations change? Well, all of a sudden, probably everybody, probably someone wouldn't say Atari Pong, but everybody's interpretations on this Zoom call would be bound by the context of kids playing in a park. So in a second, by me stating the purpose of the animation, I can sync up everybody's meaning making structure in this room right now in a sentence. That's how being able to state our purpose in an everyday setting works. It helps us to stay connected to the bigger storyline because what happens in the absence of a storyline when we are reacting and not keeping this front and center is we can kind of make up our own, start asking those questions. Why am I doing this? What am I doing this for? Um, but purpose, when we can restate it for us, contextualizes all of what's going on. And the big question, right, is what's your storyline? Because when we don't have purpose, we get a lot of wasted energy. When we do have purpose, that's again, part of our everyday response, especially to difficulty it aligns everything and everything is connected towards something better, bigger. It's why purpose um, elicits a pulling force, whereas just results in things elicit a pushing force. And so it's powerful. Uh, we are pattern seeking, uh, meaning seeking creatures. Yeah, and Brock said the leading question implies that we should be looking for action. Sure, it says like the experiment, it says that what is, happening here and implies that there is something happening, but it doesn't imply what the nature of what's happening, the quality that all of a sudden vividly the emotional stories and pictures um, that come to play. You're right. We're inherently pattern seeking uh, creatures and meaning making creatures by default, and we'll make meaning no matter what is happening. So again, having purpose is different than being purposeful. Being purposeful is acting and responding with the context in front of us all the time of our bigger why. Let me give you a couple of examples of being purposeful that I've encountered recently. This is Brittany Ray. She is a chef in Denver. She was also a bartender and she actually lost both of her jobs at the beginning of the pandemic. And one may react with fear and anger and frustration uh, and panic and, because she needed that money to survive. But she said, you know, what, what is my purpose? And she realized that her purpose was to feed people. She was a chef. And she asked herself, how can I use my purpose right now? And she actually ended up renting out this, uh, well, not renting out, they gave it to her, this bottom floor of a church building. She got her other chef friends together and they started creating a kitchen where they made meals for people who were stuck at home, elderly who couldn't afford it, who were quarantined. She ended up getting, starting a nonprofit based on this, ended up getting a lot of uh, attention and funding. But the big impetus for her doing this was in a time of crisis, she asked this question, who needs me, right? Instead of how am I going to get through this? She asked, who needs me to get through this? Who needs my purpose? So one of the things I want you to reflect on uh, right now is if you're going through a challenge, instead of that initial reaction of how will I get through this? Resilient people tend to think, who needs me to get through this? Again, who needs my system of resilience to be activated? So one portion of reflection is think about who needs you to thrive. And if you could right now on that worksheet, just write down three people who rely on you. So who needs you to thrive? And list three people who rely on you. And, and I encourage people to think about them by name because one of the most powerful ways to embed purpose in our response to especially difficulty 
is to be able to think about who needs us to make it through. When I uh, have been doing a lot of work with people at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the questions that we worked on reframing was instead of what can I do to make it through this, who needs me to get through this? And it can be a very powerful reframe. So as you're working through this session, uh, write down three people who rely on you. And again, that can serve as a really powerful tool and resource that you can have to look back on. And I hope that whenever you feel that challenge or that struggle that you can go back and look at those three people and say, say they need me and see how that can reframe our mental processes. Another example is from my work with janitors. I just finished up a research study working with janitors at uh, a university. And this is Ellen. She is a janitor who has been there for over 25 years. And uh, one of the things that Ellen uh, talks about is that one of the things that she doesn't like doing is cleaning the bathrooms of the dormitories uh, on a Monday morning. So she works in the university dormitories. You can imagine why. But one of the things that she does is she said that it's one of the tasks I dislike the most, but every time I go to do it, I say to myself, I'm doing this so that these kids don't get sick. And what we find in interviewing thousands of people in frontline work and in, in, in the trades and in craft work is that they have a purposeful mindset, those who are thriving through difficulty. And Ellen had a very difficult life outside of work, which I'll talk about later, but she had that so that mentality, right? So think about what is your so that. And that's what we call having a purposeful mindset. You'll also notice that Ellen is crocheting hats. She uses her break time to crochet hats for all of the students in her dormitory so that when she uh, leaves for the day in the, in the winter, when she goes to her car, she says, I can see all of the kids wearing the hats as they go to and from their classes. And so I'm reminded of my impact. There's uh, Tapley, my now six-year-old, she made him a hat. She made the former governor of California, uh, Colorado, John Hickenlooper, a hat. So she's relatively famous. But her approach is driven on purpose. And it's that mindset, I'm doing this so that what, that she said helps pull her through. Now, Ellen was near homelessness before she started this uh, position as a janitor. And she recalls that during her first uh, moments in the job, she was really down on herself because she had to take this job. She was asking herself, you know, I wish I could have done something more with my life. And uh, she said a supervisor had pulled her aside and defined the word custodian for her as someone who takes responsibility of a physical space and everybody in it. And she said, that was the first time in my life where I really felt like I mattered. And that belief that I mattered and that I had responsibility is what's pulled me through my life over the last 25 years and developed that purposeful approach and perspective, even in difficulty. I mean, the conditions of the job, one of the reasons why I study the job is because the conditions of the job are really difficult. And we use some of this research to help make changes there. But one of the commonalities of people who thrived and were resilient was they had that so that mentality. So what's that so that for you? You know, you're uh, reacting to this so that what? Uh, Carla says another reason to give children media, uh, meaningful chores. I like that too, um, Carla. It's true, but making sure people can see and that you can see that when you're going through something right now, uh, that that thing is not just on its own. It's connected to something bigger. So one of the things we're going to do at the end of today is state that so that. I'm doing this so that what? I'm moving through this so that what? And so when we find people adopt a purposeful perspective we know it impacts engagement. I mean, you could just imagine this, right? Ellen comes to work every day. She knows she's there to educate. Uh, she knows he's there to be part of the educational fabric of the university so that the kids don't get sick. And then say you have George who comes to work every day and he's just there to get through to the weekend. The qualitative response to the same stressor is different. And we find that in the research that people who are purposeful, live longer, they have a lower incidence of early mortality uh, rates, they're more likely to experience contentedness, more likely to learn something new. But the key is not just having purpose, the key is making sure we're approaching our challenges and our everyday situations, even tasks that are not pleasant in a way that we connect it to 
something bigger. And so I want to go over a few points of why this works, and then we'll get into some practices and really work through that worksheet. And one of the reasons why purpose works to foster and activate resilience is that it focuses our mind on contribution, which optimizes our brains and our bodies. Uh, I don't know if anybody on here is a running fan. Is anybody a running fan? Okay. I see some people nodding. I see some people not nodding <laughs> and like looking away. I am not a running fan. I'm a fan of watching other people competitively run, but driving 26 miles kind of makes me bored. So I can't imagine running marathons. Does anybody run a marathon? If you're on gamma, raise your hand if you have. Okay, no. 26 miles is a long way, but this is Desiree Linden. She's the women's winner of the 2018 Boston Marathon. And she gives us a profound example of what happens uh, in difficulty when we focus on our purpose. If you look at the picture here, it was raining and miserable in Boston. So this is a Boston 43 degrees and visible rain on a camera. And the cameras caught Desiree going off the course at the beginning and getting sick and coming back on. She told uh, post-race interviewers that this was uh, a race in which she knew that she was only gonna last a few miles and she was gonna drop out at about mile 10. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't have done a 10 mile jog if it wasn't my day. I would have had a coffee and donut somewhere, but that's why I'm not an elite runner. And so Desiree decided to stick with it. And what she did is she, at about mile five, she said she made a decision that changed everything for her. She saw an elite group of runners that was struggling at the front of the pack. And she went up to them and said, hey, if you need anything, let me know. I'm going to be dropping out today. If you need me to block wind for you or grab water cups for you, let me know. And she said that probably to the dismay of the elite group of runners, but she said that about three miles after she started helping and started disassociating her feelings and negative feelings and started thinking about the broader impact, she said she miraculously got her legs back. She went on to win the Boston Marathon. Now, this actually upset Desiree because in her post-race interview, she was saying, running is a predictive sport. Usually I know exactly what I put into my body, exactly what it will do, and exactly the output that it will have. But she said, I've never experienced an effect physically as the effect I experienced when I thought about these other people. And her sports psychologist and UCLA Semmel Center for Neuroscience got involved and said, you know, that's not surprising there's a part of our brain that's hardwired for altruism. And when we think about our impact on other people, think about a broader purpose, we actually get a boost of the neurotransmitters called dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. And these are just the fancy names for the neurotransmitters that control for mood, movement, and motivation. And it's that thinking of our broader contribution, that bigger why, that's the crux of why purpose works for resilience because it makes our bodies and our minds more resilient. So a really powerful story and, and something that shows just, it's not only just helping other people, but it's how we think about our legacy and our lives and our purpose that helps us embrace challenges. Uh, Angela Duckworth in the book called Grit. I don't know, has anybody on here read the book Grit by Angela Duckworth? It's a wide ranging study on what compels people to persevere over time. So that's what grit is. It's perseverance over a long period of time. And one of the things that she finds in her wide ranging study is that one of the number one predictors of a high grit scale is having that sense of purpose that is front and center. The pleasure line on here is when everything's going well. And oftentimes I think we want we think we want everything to go well, but I think what we really want is to understand what the purpose of it is when it's not going well. Because we don't thrive again, despite our challenges, we thrive because of them. And what she found is the number one predictor of those who had resilience and grit was having that purpose front and center. You can actually go on our website and take the grit scale. It's like a five question scale. I'll warn you, it's very humbling to take it. Um, I didn't get a high score and I still don't know why, but you can take that and um, see where you're at in that. So it's a really powerful tool. And then finally, purpose works because it's more durable than achievement. Um, it's more durable than just getting through to the end of the day, right? It's something that outlasts our jobs, our careers. It even outlasts us. Uh, and oftentimes when we just think about 
resilience and being resilient is just getting through, there's always going to be another mountain, right? The problem with being motivated just by a goal or by getting through to the end of something is the fact that we can get there. And then what? That stuff is important, but making sure that we know the bigger legacy that we're trying to leave and that bigger why and keeping that front and center is critical. So we've talked about why, what purpose is, why it works. Remember, purpose is your contribution. It's your, your bigger reason. It's important because it serves as the grand storyline. It contextualizes all of the stuff that's happening to us. We're wired to just react to stuff and make sense of it. When we don't have that sense, we can waste a lot of energy. And it works because it inspires, uh, it makes us better inspires us to think about contribution, which optimizes our bodies. It predicts resilience and it lasts longer than just these time-based results. And so now I want to move into how do we craft a purposeful mindset? So how do we craft a purposeful approach? What are some tactics we can use? And then we'll jump into how you can state your purpose here today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break you out into groups. But before I do, I want to just say that if you don't want to go into a breakout room, you don't have to. Uh, You can hang out in the main room and just listen, or you can go to the breakout room and just listen. I want to put that open to you all because I know it's not entirely comfortable for everybody. But what I do want to have you do is I want you to think about a time in your work when you most believed that you and your role mattered. Now, because of the nature of your jobs, you may think, well, I get up every day. Zach, and my job matters. I know that. But the point of this exercise is to really think specifically about a moment in which you most believed that your role mattered. When was it? Who was around? What was said or done? Think back and try to bring that moment to life. And then what I'm going to have you do is uh, Carla's going to break you out into breakouts. And I'll put the instructions in the chat right now so you have it. But what I want you to do is think about that moment. Uh, Think about uh, what that moment was, what was going on, and just spend about a minute, make sure you introduce yourself and where you're coming from, but just spend a minute or so per person sharing what that story was. And I want you to notice what happens in the group. I want you to notice what happens with you when you hear that story. And I want you to notice what happens when you think about and tell that story. So share the time in your work work when you most believed your work mattered and be very specific. And then the second thing I want you to do is as a group, talk about what you noticed by being prompt to think specifically uh, for that. So Carla is going to break you into groups of about five. We'll have about seven or so minutes for this. So about a minute per person. Again, if you don't want to share, that's totally, I'd like to just open it up for those of you who did go into a breakout room and talked about this. Uh, what what uh, was that like for you all? What did you notice about either thinking about that specific moment for you or just hearing other people's stories? So uh, go ahead and you can raise your hand uh, or just jump in. Hi, my name is Caitlin. Hey, and, Caitlin. Um, very exciting. I actually had a lots of fun the, the people in there were amazing to speak with. And we all kind of shared similar um, purposes. And we all, mm, ser- mm-hmm, you know, shared mm-hmm. similar, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure maybe based on just kind of like the, uh, the group setting and yeah. the individuals that were kind of, you know, announced to this meeting. But um, I think that it was uplifting and kind of being able to relate to somebody and hear somebody else's story. Yeah. And it kind of gives us more purpose. Yeah. 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 So remind, <laughs> I'm having a great you. Friday. <laughs> so that's thank you. good. That's good. Yeah. So it, it reminds you uh, of that. And yeah, that's what story, that's what this idea of store, better storytelling does. Cause oftentimes, like, especially in, in your work, I'm sure there's a lot of like, negative things that you see. Yeah. And I've kind of came to this point this past week, I've been noticing something about myself emotionally. And um, so when I seen this pop up um, as an invitation, I said to myself, I think this is kind of like what I needed to kind of get another, like 
a, yeah. you know, I don't know, a cold glass of water. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. And one of the, those, that's what those stories can be is a, is a cold glass of water. And we deliberately tell ourselves and remember those stories, especially in times like this. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you guys. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I, what were some other I things? Hey, Laura. Sin, I had a sense of um, support. I felt connected, mm. camaraderie, validation. We all shared similar experiences working with kids and, yeah. and how we help and support. And, you know, hearing some of somebody else's stories, you know, just gave me a lift, lift up. Like, you know, we are making a difference in kids' lives in, yeah. in each of our ways. And that just made my heart really happy. You get showed, like stories give us the evidence of yes. our meaningfulness. Yes. And our meaning. What, um, uh, I'm curious is, did you, uh, did you tell, did anybody tell a story that they haven't told before or haven't told often? Um, well, you, we, yeah. we all work with kids so it, right. and parents. So it kind of brought us like connected of, as far as like yeah. how we interact with them, how we support them, the results of that. And sometimes yep. we don't only see at the beginning, we might see it later, but yeah. it just is a good feeling to know that. You yeah. Know, so stories remind you of the end of your work, like the result, yeah. right? It's like, yes. it's like going back to Ellen's story of the janitor, the, so that we mm -hmm. do this, so that what, and it helps remind us of that. Good. Right. Good. I'm glad. Right. Other reactions, other thoughts about that breakout stories really showed everyone's passion. Renee said, good. So there are a couple of types of stories in, on our teams with ourselves. And they're the stories we tell ourselves and the stories we tell each other. And when it comes to resilience, one of the best ways to remember our purpose is to collect and tell ourselves stories of the impact. Remember that time when. So like when there's a negative situation that comes up in a negative, um, you're exposed to something negative and you're ready to react, really thinking back, like remember that time when this happened, when this had a positive outcome or on your teams, creating space to collect and tell these stories of impact. You know, at the end of a week, even saying like, when is a time this week where you most saw that your work mattered? And especially doing it in the difficult times, right? It sounds counterintuitive when we're just trying to like react and help kids literally keep going and survive to think about that. But that's that fuel that keeps us going, right? Um, so telling yourselves better stories and telling others better stories is a really key practice. And so I really invite you to, to weekly think about a story, a very specific one that you could tell someone else or that you could remember to tell yourselves. And these things dramatically um, change how we think about what we're going through. I was doing a session for a group of distribution center managers and they worked for a, a company that made MRI machines and that treated very early stage, you know, very difficult illnesses. But they were like two or three steps removed from that end outcome, like what would actually happen in the MRI machine. And I remember this distribution center group of managers, they were relatively miserable and I got asked to come speak with them. And I stopped the session and I just asked, you know, why are you here? And there was a woman in the front. She was a distribution center manager. She had been there for almost 13 years. She started uh, tearing up a little bit. And I was like, okay, I messed this up. I don't know what happened. But she said that, you know, she, no one's ever asked her why she's there, you know, after all her time doing this. And then she said that she was diagnosed with an early stage cancer the uh, month before. And she was in an MRI machine and she saw the uh, logo of the MRI machine. And she remembered that logo being on the boxes in the distribution centers. And so she says this to all of her rest of her team that were sitting there. You could tell they weren't really engaged. She says, I've, I'm realizing right now that my job has existed for the last 12 years to save my own life. You talk about an antidote to employee disengagement. That room changed, right? And uh, that is the power of a story, a single story of the work's impact. And one of the things that um, that group did is they stayed longer and they ended up actually thinking who needs to hear these stories. And so they went down to the packers and the distribution centers. And all we did differently is every week at the safety meeting, we would bring in a customer or show a video of a customer or a user of an MRI machine and have them tell their stories of the work's impact. And the morale went up, engagement went up, people's sense of uh, well-being went up. 
And these were frontline workers who had many of them had difficult lives outside of work and they were yearning for this meaning and stories can unlock that meaning. Uh, researcher Adam Grant at the Wharton School did a um, study and he studied university call center workers. These are people who work at a university call center. They call people for donations and they get told no all day long. And um, all he did differently is he took an experimental group and he had a beneficiary of a scholarship come in once and tell the story of how the scholarship changed their life for 10 minutes for that shift. The other shift, he didn't do anything. And what he found is over six months, the group that heard that story once on average brought in double the amount of time, double the amount of donations, but also spent double the amount of time on the phone. There was a 400% increase in motivation and performance for the group that heard that story once. And it wasn't just that they heard the story once, is that they started creating a culture of storytelling on that team. So they felt the power of the story and regularly committed to telling stories like when they got off the phone with somebody who had a great experience at the college. And it's this culture of storytelling, both our internal storytelling and external storytelling that can recenter us back on purpose. Because ultimately what we nurture grows. So the stories we tell in our head grow outwardly. And one of the other ways that we can recenter on purpose is to re-examine the questions that we ask ourselves every day. Remember I said to you, like, one of the things I was doing is getting up every day, looking at my calendar and saying, what do I have to do today? That's a pretty bad question. It's not very motivational when you think about it. But our questions determine what our brain pays attention to. And we ask internal questions of ourselves all the time. And one of the things to nurture is the questions you ask. And that helps our brains to focus on what we want to continue to think about. And my poor kid, there's Tapley again, uh, he has me for a dad. So I did an experiment on him. I was getting some pretty lousy answers to my questions when I was picking him up from daycare. Uh, and he would say things I would, I would ask, what did you do today? And he'd just start listing things that he did that day. And I realized that that's probably, probably not a good question. You know, if I was asking, what did you do today? All I was ever going to get was a list of things that he did, a regurgitation of his schedule. So I started asking him two other questions. Who did you help today and who helped you today? And what happened over the course of a couple of weeks of doing this is I started learning more about him than I had ever asked by, learned by asking, what did you do today? Uh, I learned that he helped someone build a Lego tower. He loved being a door holder. I learned all about these things. And one day he came in and before I even asked the question, he said, oh no, daddy, I, I can't think of who helped me today. I'm going to have to look harder tomorrow. And so the questions that we ask, right, determine what we pay attention uh, to. So even at the end of each day, just asking this question, who did you help and who helped you today can help you reframe especially difficult times and help your brain to be focused on that bigger purpose. Now, here's my kid again, because another practice to nurture uh, purpose is to respond instead of react. Uh, let's say Santa Claus is a external pressure here. And that's my kid when he was really little reacting. And that's how we're wired, right? We're re wired to react on emotion. Uh, he obviously is freaking out there, but our brains really haven't evolved from a reactive stance from when we're little kids to now. Uh, we tend to react to survive, right? React on instinct instead of responding. And so one of the really powerful ways to maintain a purposeful approach is to reflect on this question, am I reacting or am I responding? Because again, when we react on negative emotions, we narrow our attention to survival. But when we react in a way that produces positive emotions, we expand our attention so that we survive and can thrive. Uh, we look outward, we develop better relationships, we have more self-belief. And one of the best ways to start doing this is to really take stock of where in your work and where in your life you might be reacting instead of responding. And one great way that's worked for me is just to stop, you know, before when I feel myself getting really like emotionally charged about something, to stop, to name your initial reaction, even if you have to write it down, like, what is this reaction? And then ask yourself, what am I feeling? Are you feeling fear? 
Are you feeling anger? Are you feeling frustration? Are you feeling exhaustion? Are you feeling despair? And then think to yourself, what would happen if I acted on that emotion? If I made the next choice in my life or my work based on that emotion, what would happen? And oftentimes it's between this time of feeling and then actually responding that we can expand that space and then positively and productively respond. So there's a lot of space in the intervention between when we feel a negative emotion and when we're about to respond that we often don't give ourselves enough credit for exploring and for bringing to life. And so you notice the acronym is SNAP. It's almost like snap out of it. But if you find yourself reacting more on negative emotions to certain areas, think about how you might respond. And one of the best ways to do that is before you take action, before you respond or do something as you're moving forward, is to try to seek out a positive emotion and an experience that elicits a positive emotion. What you're seeing on the screen here is a sunflower following the sun from the morning to the afternoon and then it'll reset itself at night. This is pretty amazing, but it's this principle of heliotropism, right? That as living things, we are attracted to energy that regenerates us and we resist energy that extracts from us. So ask yourself the question, am I experiencing an emotion that will regenerate my energy to handle what I'm handling? Or is this emotion something that will extract my energy that I need? As, as people and as human beings, we're attracted to that positive energy. And in teams, it can be emotionally contagious uh, in organizations. So one of the things that I'll ask you to reflect on is where in my work and life am I reacting? And what emotions am I reacting with? And how might I respond more positively? And how can I seek an experience of a positive emotion before I respond? So that's on your worksheet. And, and try to think about this, like where maybe one or two areas in your life that you're reacting and where are some areas that you could respond using a positive emotion. And now there are nine positive emotions that have been associated with thriving and well-being and resilience. And so think about these as well. If you go back and listen to this webinar or go back and look at the slides, before you respond or take action on something, can you seek out an experience that elicits joy or as Carla mentioned, gratitude or serenity or interest or hope? Could you take a walk that uh, helps you experience awe? Uh, researcher, researchers are finding that if you go on a walk and you really pay attention to something that inspires you in nature that it helps to foster resilience. Uh, can you look at something that makes you laugh, a funny video, or think about something funny your kids did? Can you find inspiration, read a quote? When we can interrupt that cycle of reacting with a positive emotion, we allow ourselves to respond better. And ultimately our lives are comprised of a series of reactions and responses. And how we collectively respond to situations is how we feel. So really think about that. You know, how might you respond more positively? And if there's something that repeatedly triggers you, can you do a positive intervention for yourself and seek to experience one of these positive emotions before you respond? And so those are some really powerful practices, right? Can you collect and tell better stories? Are you asking good questions of yourself that connect you back to your why? And can you respond instead of react? And then the final piece is reframing, right? So how can we reframe uh, situations that have happened to discern positive meaning in them? So I want you to go back to that original challenge that you thought about, that you didn't choose, but you made it through, the first reflection question. And consider asking yourself this question now, what were the benefits of that challenge in your life? And I know it's really hard to do, but this is a way that we can create uh, a meaning-making structure in our minds that is able to discern meaning in where we might not be able to find it initially. And so think about that moment and maybe type into the chat two to three words that best describe the benefits of that challenge. And I know it's counterintuitive, right, to think this way, but something you might do is think about this in the past two weeks. 
Think about a challenge that you haven't seen the benefit in that you're still struggling with and think about what the benefit is. Is it something you learned? Is it something you learned about yourself? There's some things coming in the chat here. Um, let me look at them. Uh, brought the community together, clarified my mission, made me grow up. <laughs> I, I didn't read this one from Caitlin earlier. Santa is definitely an external pressure for children. Um, thanks for commenting on that picture. Uh, but think about what that uh, benefit is. And then one of the things I invite you to think about is think about some of the challenges in your life and think about some that are maybe negatively staying with you that you might need to reframe and find the benefit in. You could do this as a team, right? Are there things or, or challenges or issues that you might need to reframe and find the meaning in that are sticking with you? And, and how might you do that? And one of the things that you might do is just list out some of those challenges and ask that question. What is the benefit of this challenge? And this is not to say that the challenges are good, right? Nobody wants something bad to happen. But the good part is when we can extract the benefit and the learning from it. And that's how we can reframe it and connect back to meaning and purpose. And so what I want to do today is end with that, right? Restating our purpose so we can go off into the weekend with a framework for how we can reconnect back to that context, that storyline. So if you look at that worksheet, there is a template that you can use to state your purpose, right? The starting point of all of this. What's the queen ant that you're trying to keep alive, right? To activate your system of resilience. And when we think about purpose, uh, we think about it as like, what's your, what's your moon mission? What's, what's the bigger contribution that you want to make? One of my favorite stories is when John F. Kennedy was about to launch the Apollo missions. He writes in his memoirs that he went to the space, uh, the space Center, and instead of going into a green room to prepare for a speech, he went into a mop closet uh, and saw a janitor there. And he went to the janitor and said, oh, what do you do here? And the janitor very calmly said, oh, I'm putting a person on the moon. And what's powerful about that is that he was able to state it just so clearly in the moment. It was in his consciousness. It was at the top of his mind. And so stating a purpose can be very powerful. And so when we think about purpose, uh, it's really where your strengths impact other people. And so uh, there are three components that come together to form our purpose. It's our passions, the things that we love to do. So just think about your day yesterday. What did you love doing? Uh, what are the things that if I were to come find you and interrupt you, you'd be mad that I'm interrupting you because you're just in, in the state of doing it, something you love doing. The second uh, is talent. What were you good at? Uh, what are the things that other people ask you to do? And the third is the impact that you want to leave on others. Where your passions and your talents connect is what's called a psychological strength. Those are the strengths that you have. Um, so when you think about that impact, when you are able to use your strengths to make that impact is when we're on purpose. So here's what I'll challenge you all to do. Uh, one of the things that I have is I want you to think about this, ask yourself, what do you love to do? What are you good at? And then how do you positively contribute to other human beings? And then I want you to take a go at creating a statement. So if any of you have ever done Mad Libs, this is like Mad Libs for purpose. So when you think about your strengths, where your passions and talents overlap, what's an action verb that you might use to bring that strength to life? So for example, my purpose is to help. It's very simple, right? I mean, but I've really thought about this. Like I've always liked helping other people achieve their visions for their lives. The next piece is, is who. So who do you help or who do you support or whatever your verb is, connect, support, um, communicate. Think about the verbs that best bring your strengths to life. The middle of mine is right people. So my purpose is to help people. And then the last piece is what do you want people to be able to think feel, be, do, or have as a result of you being on your purpose. So what do you want people to think, feel, be, do, or have as a result of you being on your purpose or on your strengths? So my purpose is to help people to realize their own significance. 
So you have that template in your worksheet. I encourage you all, maybe this weekend, maybe next week, to really take some time to define that because that is that why, right? It's the queen ant with the fire ants that's going to activate your system for your resilience. It's the so that. I'm doing the so that what as the janitor in my research project, Ellen, taught us is so important. And once you have this stated, it can be really powerful to do a few things. The first is to make sure that you actually state it and use that template and put it somewhere where you can see it. So I really encourage you to look at it at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day. When something happens to you that's causing you that negative emotion, read your purpose statement. And it may feel forced at first, but when we do that, it's incredibly powerful. The second thing I'll ask you to do is as we end today, to put your purpose statement in the chat if you have it, if you're able to have done that already, and I'll, I'll put it back up. I know some of you are like looking for it. Um, and put your statement in the chat uh, if you've done that already uh, today, what that would be for you so other people can see it. And then share it with other people. Because when this becomes used and it becomes top of mind, right, it becomes that major storyline of your life and your work. So again, just to recap some things, we talked about a little bit about resilience. It's that system of resilience. We talked about how purpose works uh, to foster that resilience. We went over some of those things like storytelling, story collecting, responding, not reacting, um, and asking yourself better questions to elicit purpose and then, and then trying to state it. And I will say this, that there's a lot here, a lot of resources you can dig back into and tools you can dig back into, and it can get overwhelming. But for the next month, just try one of them. That's the best place to start. Try doing one of these things and I know it can make uh, a big difference. And so, Renee, thank you. We had one in there. I wanted to get that before we had to wrap up today, but my purpose is to encourage parents to take control of their child's development. And my purpose is to empower my team to realize their fullest potential. So that's their, their, your why and, and your so that. And so when you can bring that in, it makes sense of everything. So 